If you would, please turn to the one chapter book of Jude. I want us to look at verses 17 through 23. Up to this point, Jude has established the need, the need, I say, for his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. With reminders of God's righteous condemnation of the ungodly, which we've studied, Jude 5 through 7. And as we've also studied, Jude 9 through 16 in verse 19, a vivid depiction of the ungodly men who have crept in unnoticed or slipped in the side door. Jude provides a series of exhortations, the design of which is to make very sure that Christians stand strong in the faith. As he says in the American Standard Version 1901, once for all delivered to the saints, Jude verses 17 through 23. You will notice that twice in these verses, Jude addresses the recipients of this letter as beloved, verses 17 and 20. It's interesting when you look at that term, it's easily read over, but you'll notice many times in the scriptures, this is the attitude of the writers toward those to whom they speak or write. As an appellation, the term beloved is then used frequently in the scriptures. Paul used the same term in Romans 12 and verse 19. And then the inspired writer to the Hebrews did so in Hebrews 6, 9. The apostle Peter did in 1 Peter 2, 11. And John did in 1 John 4, three times. Verse 1, verse 7, and verse 11. And then here is Jude doing it and at the beginning of the epistle in Jude verse 3. So it describes those addressed as being very dear to the heart of the one who is using the terminology and addressing them with this. That within itself should cause us to go through some serious self-examination as to our disposition of heart and will toward our brethren in Christ. It's with such love in his heart that we find then the inspired Jude giving these exhortations, these very necessary exhortations to keep these beloved, these brethren, these members of the church, these citizens of the kingdom of heaven, these with the hope or expectation of heaven from being misled by those who are ungodly with their false doctrines. And I must pause here to say then, if one has a proper understanding of the love that God has for us, the love we have for the world, necessary to motivate us to take the gospel, God's power to the world, Romans 1, 16, to save them. And then once we are saved from our sins and added to the church, we've been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the love we ought to cultivate and have one for another. I still believe we would understand better brotherly love and the fellowship that God expects to be in his family, the church, between brothers and sisters, if we were in a culture and society that existed or like existed in the first century Mediterranean world. You see, a person could fully believe in Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins and commit sin. Maybe try to justify himself in that sin. But that didn't mean he had repudiated everything about the gospel system, the existence of the God of the Bible in Christ. He still was living separate from much of the world. But he still had committed sins. And he needed to repent of those sins. And I simply use an example of the man in Corinth who had committed that sin, who having his father's wife, was in a more egregious state of sin than even many unbelievers among the Corinthians. And they lived about as bad a life as possible morally. Well, why did withdrawing fellowship from that person impact him? Sometimes I guess we think he just went on back into the world and eyed God and just embraced what he came out of. No, he had no place to go. Nothing in the Bible says 
he didn't believe in God in Christ or the church or the proper way to worship God or prayer. But here was a sin in his life. Now, if he does not repent of that sin, and the church, as Paul commanded, withdraws the fellowship that should be between Christians and exist between them because of their faithfulness to God, then where is he going to go? He has no place to go. So let us not read into the scripture what's not there. Because he had a sin, or sins in some cases, didn't mean he had repudiated the whole Christian system. He was still separate from the whole system of that present evil age. And thus, he was caused to think seriously of being cut off by his one sin, which he refused to repent of, of the fellowship of the saints. Today, many times, somebody commits sin, they don't want to repent of it. The church may sometimes withdraw fellowship from them. What do they do? Skip, 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 go to another congregation. Nobody says a thing. They don't feel cut off from anything that was so special to the church in the first century. It may come to where people who really want to serve God and are caught up in a sin of sins may realize there's no place to go but to repent and straighten yourself up out of that sin. Now, as we consider these exhortations, as we're calling it, to the beloved, the brethren, we need to bear in mind that as God's children, we too are beloved. Paul says we're beloved of God in Romans 1 and verse 7. And that these exhortations are therefore directed to each one of us as a member of the church regarding what we're to be. Now this first exhortation we'll notice is designed to, of course, as all of them are, to keep us from stumbling or uh, going into some sort of error. He says, remember the words spoken before. This is in verses 17 and 18. Remember the words spoken before. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can't remember what you never knew, so they had to know it first so they could call it to mind. That would mean they would need to remember who spoke them. They were the apostles of Jesus Christ, selected of Christ, chosen of Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven. As Christ said at the right hand of God ruling, they were on the earth, and they gave us the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit revealed the mind of Christ to them. And that's how we got our New Testament is through the apostles and prophets, those who had received a miraculous gift such as Luke or Mark through the laying on of the apostles' hands. So Christ, through the power of the Spirit, by these men, gave us his final will and testament. They were then duly appointed as apostles of Christ. They were authorized to be and do what they did. They were sent out by Jesus on a certain mission. Thus the church was to heed them. Even as it listened and heeded the Lord himself. John 13 and verse 20. So they were to remember those things. They were to remember not only who spoke these words or wrote them. But they were to remember what they said. Now, Peter, in dealing with some of these things, says in 2 Peter 3, 1 through 3, that there will be mockers in the last time, making light, making fun of the Christian system. And we find Paul addressing the young evangelist Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that they would be walking according to their own ungodly lust. Now, for us today, then we must remember who wrote them, and what they wrote. And this implies a very diligent, constant study with regularity of the Word of God. It means we have to learn how to study the Word of God, how to write and divide the Word of truth as we study, 2 Timothy 2.15. How does the New Testament authorize us to act? For it's the King's will presented in these words. And we don't do anything except... Our Lord authorizes us to do it. Colossians 3.17. That is, if we want to be found faithful to Him. I say again, if I say, well, I believe God wants me to do thus and so. Then I better be able to find that thus saith the Lord. Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. 
And when we walk by faith and not by sight or as things appear to our human senses, then we're walking as the Holy Spirit through the word of truth leads, guides, and directs us. He points out in verse 20 that we're to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. Now I want you to notice that to build up suggests growth. It's not enough just to lay down one level of knowledge and understanding and stop right there. We must, it's imperative, it's obligatory that we continue to build upon it. As the Apostle Peter expressed it, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. So we need to take advantage of every opportunity to study and learn. That's the reason I stand amazed when people say, well, I don't think I have to be there for Bible study. Well, what you think is not going to judge you someday, but what the Lord thinks is recording His Word uh, will. And it indicates that we ought to be interested in spiritual growth. But there can't be that spiritual growth if we don't study the Bible. And thus we ought to be in following Matthew 6.33 of seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. There ought to be that desire to avail ourselves of every opportunity to learn more about the Bible. It's not to say we don't have to will ourselves to subject ourselves to it. But the only reason I know we'd want to learn more about the Bible is to live more in harmony with God's will. So we need to take advantage of opportunities to study and learn. Then he says to build up yourselves. Yourselves. This is, of course, suggesting strongly personal responsibility certainly God wants us to be saved and if we have a godly family they want us to be saved and we know faithful brethren want us to be saved and as they do what they are capable of doing then they encourage us to be saved but it all comes down to it when all said and done you must accept personal responsibility and make the effort if I lose my soul, it will not be your fault. Well, what about the people that live ungodly lives to influence you for evil? I still must let them lead me away. Now, it's easier to be in fellowship with God's people who love the truth and live the truth. But regardless of what's around us, we have the obligation not to be deceived, and to do what's necessary not to be deceived. That goes back to studying prayer. And then to put these things into practice in our own lives. Notice he talks about the most holy faith. What is that? Well, it's the faith for which we are to contend. Jude 3. I'd hate to know that the most holy faith is not that for which we should contend. It is that faith that comes from the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. It's your individual trust and confidence in God. You say, well, I trust God. I have great confidence in Him. I have faith in Him. I believe in Him. That means taking Him at His word. And that means doing what He said and the way He said it for the reason He said it. Sometimes there's one reason He says we can do it. But nevertheless, that's the way we're sure that we obey Him in all things. And remember, long before the New Testament was written, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments so it's that body of doctrine in which our personal faith is to rest it's that body of doctrine which has been revealed one time for all times and this of course pertains to what our Lord Jesus Christ has done and will do for us now these first two exhortations stress the importance of our continuing steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. Acts 2 verse 47. Now that means to study diligently. And then with all effort to will ourselves to apply the Word of God to our lives. But Bible study all alone will not suffice. There's also the need to pray. As he says here in verse 20. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Prayer is the necessary complement to God's Word. I don't have to say it any other way. By the Word of God, God speaks to us, directs us, tells us His will. By prayer, 
we speak to God as the Word of God teaches us to speak to Him. The Word of God then is the source of strength and comfort to us, but then so also is prayer. Listen to what is said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing. I mean, don't be anxious about things. Why should a faithful child of God be anxious? But in everything, not some things, not most things, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, let there has the force of a commandment. That's what we're to be doing. What follows that kind of biblically taught prayer? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. I suggest to you that when you're in the state of verse 7, you can't lose your soul. But it's up to me to keep myself in the love of God. So think of prayer and the Word of God as the two legs upon which our spiritual well-being stands. Each one of them is needed to be well balanced in our spiritual growth. To study the Bible and never pray doesn't make too good a sense, does it? Doesn't even sound right. But to study the Bible and follow the Bible's teaching regarding prayer makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes we ask, well, what does it mean? I know petitioning the Father. I know the teaching of the Bible, how I approach the Father. I know what the Bible says about the attitude of heart and the way I'm living and approaching the Father, I know that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does it mean, supplication? Well, I think one of the best things I could uh, say to direct anybody to understand prayer and supplication is just to read the Psalms. And notice how the psalmist would pour out his heart to God. And I think you'll understand supplication better by seeing it used in the Old Testament, a place where you can go and learn, rather than even giving just a definition of it. Well, what is meant by praying in the Spirit? Well, he doesn't elaborate here. That is, Jude doesn't. And Paul doesn't. He uses the expression in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. But Paul does use the expression... In Galatians 5, in verse 25, walk in the Spirit. Now, I think that is just simply implying that walking or living according to the Spirit's direction is found in the Word of God. The writer of Hebrews said, now the Word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You also must realize the New Testament is even being written as Jude writes this. Thus miraculous gifts were in the church. And if you read those nine miraculous gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, you will see that they're singing in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. That is, until the New Testament was fully revealed and written down, then these miraculous gifts worked. And so I think, too, that praying in the Spirit would be exercising a miraculous gift by the Holy Spirit given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and thus it would be, for all practical purposes, a miraculous prayer. That was temporary, provisionary, until the times of miracles passed away, and we're all under the Word of God that furnishes us completely under every good work. So it emphasizes that our prayers must be in harmony with the mind of Christ, which the Holy Spirit has revealed in the Word of God, the New Testament of Christ. And that's very important. I think it is somewhat akin, if we can go there, to 1 John 5 and verse 14. He says there to Christians, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. The only qualification on anything is that it be in harmony with the rest of the Bible teaching on what Christians should pray. And if that's not praying in the Spirit, <laughs> tell me how you're going to pray in the Spirit, except that you would live in the first century at the time there were the miraculous gifts in the church in lieu of the completed New Testament. 
Diligent Bible study and prayer are certainly essential to keep from falling or being caught up by false teachers necessary for contending for the faith. But as we continue to consider Jude's exhortation to the beloved, we learn there's more that needs to be done. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. I want you to think about that for a moment. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, I have a responsibility to keep myself in the love of God. And again, we see the need for personal responsibility. Notice, keep yourselves. The word for keep is the same word translated preserved in verse 1 of Jude. So if I'm kept, I'm preserved. <laughs> if I'm preserved, I'm kept. In the love of God. But John spends a lot of time saying, you can know if you're in the love of God if you keep his commandments and if you love the brethren. So while we are indeed preserved in Jesus Christ, same as being preserved in the church, remember to be baptized I-N-T-O, into Christ, Galatians 3.27, only doorway into Christ is to be baptized into the place, listen, of preservation. Of the place where you're kept. That's why we must be faithful. That's the only realm there is where you're preserved. Spiritually preserved and reserved by being faithful for heaven itself. As Peter wrote, we're kept by the power of God through faith. 1 Peter 1 and verse 5. Well, the gospel is God's power to save us from sin. And we could very well, without doing any violence at all to Jude 3, substitute the word gospel for faith. Contend for the gospel once for all delivered to the saints. Or contend for the New Testament. And we could add here, or any component part of it, once for all delivered to the saints. These are terms the Holy Spirit has used to refer to to the whole New Testament system of salvation that is the perfect law of liberty. And you could use that, James 1.25, and do no violence to the Scripture and certainly help us understand better what the faith is. And I would stop here and say, though most know this, that when he says contend for the faith, that he's talking about one item, one part of the whole gospel system. system faith. But the Holy Spirit pulls it out and has it stand for the whole system. So we contend for the faith. We contend for the New Testament system. We contend for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We contend for the perfect law of liberty, and so on. The power of God is the divine contribution to keeping us safe. But the power of God saves the gospel. No wonder it must be preached to every creature. But man has a will. He has a mind. He can understand it, he can reject it, or he can just reject it because he doesn't want to understand it. He has that power. So you can reject the power of God to save you by rejecting the gospel. Or once you're in Christ, reject any part of it pertaining to keeping you preserved or faithful in the church, in Christ. And you won't be preserved. You know, it's sort of like a can. You know, you can stuff, you go to the store... And these women that shop well, and most do, they'll pull, a say, a can of soup off. And guess what even the people who preserve that soup in that can will tell you if you see a bulge on one end of that. Well, good possibility the seal is broken. And it's not good anymore. To use Paul's terms, we noted this morning in 2 Corinthians, in all term class, you become disqualified of soup I want to eat. <laughs> and some have eaten that disqualified soup and lived, at least for a little while, to regret it. So remaining faithful, then, is the human contribution to being kept safe. So you see, it's, it, it takes the human responsibility to do the will of God or come 
discharge those obligations God and his word set upon us, but then it takes God through the instrument of salvation, the gospel, the faith, the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament system. So we're kept by the power of God through faith. Will God save me if I don't believe and obey the gospel? No. But he stands ready to save everybody from their sins according to the way he saves people and according to the place he preserves them. We are to keep ourselves in God's love. Jesus taught that keeping the commandments is the very key to abiding in God's love. It's how we will be loved by the Father. I want to be loved by the Father. When I'm talking to Christians, we've heard believe from the heart and obeyed that form of doctrine. We've been added to the church. Well, I want to remain in God's love. For all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are in Christ. And I was baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27, Ephesians 1.3. Well, how does that happen? I continue to keep the commandments. It's how we'll be loved by the Son. John 5, 15, 9 through 10. And earlier, John 14, 21 through 23. Now remember, those passages are delivered by Jesus to the apostles relative to their being faithful and what they're to teach to others. And so the principle is... God will save you if you will believe and obey the truth in becoming a Christian and in the church. Now, this is not legalism, as some people would declare it. It's simply a recognition of the importance of doing what God said and the way he said it for the reason he said it. Doing what God commands. Making sure you're fully, fully compliant with his will. You know, that, that's not a bad thing in life, is it? To do various things, you have to be fully compliant. Well, we think a person's a pretty good fellow if he's fully compliant. But in religion, people want to make you out a legalist as if you're doing things God didn't say or you're trusting in your own salvation. That is, your own power to save you. No, it's just me being fully compliant that I might be saved by God. It's demonstrating my trust in God to save me according to the system he's ordained to save me. Obeying the commandments of Christ then are an essential element of recognizing the Lord's authority and even in keeping the great commission to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Keeping the commandments of God, Paul says to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19, is all that really matters. You ought to mark that verse down. It just plainly, Paul just plainly says that. It's also the ultimate proof that we love God and his children. 1 John 5, 2 through 3. I want you to think about this for a minute. Here's a child of God. Gets caught up in a sin. He won't repent. And we love him so much, we won't do what the Lord said to do to restore him. You don't love him. You can tell yourself you love him. You may have some sort of emotional attachment to him, but not a God love. If you loved him like Jesus did, you'd do what God said to do to get him where he needs to be. And if he won't do it after that, you purify the church by getting rid of him. Now understand how I mean getting rid of him. A little leaven leaven the whole lump. So therefore, you don't want bad leavening in the church. Well, bad leavening is not in the song books. It, it, it's not in the pew pads. It's not in your sports coat. But bad leavening is in the person in that sports coat or in that dress or in that skirt or Whatever. Remember what we say about how does false doctrine spread? False teachers. How does the gospel of Christ spread? Faithful members of the church. So to be, so to, to, to Bible study and to prayer, then we must add the actual application of God's word to our lives if we wish to keep from falling. And we don't select and say, well, this is easy to do. Let's all do this. But now that's difficult right there. I think we'll concentrate on easy. I'm glad the Lord didn't have that view when it came to Gethsemane and the cross. But to avoid turning our efforts then to just simply meritorious acts. And that's not what we mean by commandment keeping. We don't mean like, well, I, I've done 20 good things here and three bad ones over here. This outweighs that. Thus, my merits are greater and I get the Boy Scout, whatever. That's not it. 
We obey God's commandments because it demonstrates our faith in God's system to save me. It demonstrates my faith in Jesus and what He did on the cross. Look for the mercy of our Lord. Brethren, we need mercy. I, I, I hope we never consider it to be growth, spiritual growth. If we get to the point where we think, I don't need the mercy of the Lord. It's the people that need the mercy of the Lord and know what the mercy of the Lord is and how He offers it to us that's going to study that Bible and that's going to pray. We must always be looking forward. Looking forward according to Paul to Titus and Titus 2, 11 through 13. Looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Looking forward to the coming of the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Looking for that new heavens and that new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. Especially as it pertains to eternal life and mercy. Eternal life is not something we earn, I say again. But is graciously by God's favor given to us who remain faithful in the church or in Christ. Romans six twenty three. We are saved not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to God's mercy that we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy in Titus 3, 4 through 7. So we must conclude that the prayer that Paul had for Onesiphorus should be the prayer that we all have for each other, for ourselves. Listen. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8. Now if you can't pray that about your brothers and sisters in the Lord, then don't expect to find mercy yourself on that day. The final exhortation speaks not so much to what we can do to keep ourselves from falling, but what we should do to save others who are in danger. Be compassionate, something that's pretty well forgotten by a great many people. And do so with fear, lest we fall by some other way while concentrating on somebody else's sin. Verses 22 through 23. You know what a spotlight does. If we had a spotlight here and it were to shine, say, over here on Ken, every eye would turn to Ken. That's just the way it works. That's why you have a spotlight or whoever the light were to come on, buddy, or who, any one of us or me. That, that's just the way it works. If we don't watch out as Christians, we may put the spotlight on somebody's sin and we go to looking at that sin and we don't see our own. That's always been something that as a preacher of the gospel of Christ in all these years that has greatly concerned me. I can't conceive of preaching the gospel of Christ from any other state than to save David Brown's soul. And that means I've got to apply the same thing. And Paul thought that, that he buffeted his body and brought it under subjection, lest after having preached to others, he himself was cast away. And Paul told Timothy, you be sure and preach, I'm summarizing now, the whole truth of God concerning salvation. You're not only save those who hear you, but you'll save yourself. So we want to save ourselves, for mercy will only be shown to the merciful, James 2.13. And let me ask you something. Do you consider yourself a merciful person? Now, when do you want mercy? It's when you sin. It's when you know you're wrong. It's when you know the law condemns you. That's when you fall down before he who exercises the punishment and says, Mercy, please have mercy on me. Well, God did through Christ and the gospel. And because we're faithful doesn't mean we've already arrived. We also want then to have mercy on those who are in danger, outside of Christ, even in Christ. Compassion is needed to move us to action. Let me ask you a question. What moves you, what motivates you to action in dealing with your brethren or in dealing with those outside of Christ who need the gospel? I hope we never take great satisfaction. I say, caught you, buddy. Got you now. You're not what you thought you were. If that's mercy, and if that's compassion, deliver me from it. Compassion is needed. 
need it as much as a person who wants to become a Christian needs baptism to properly handle those in danger. How do I know that? Well, let me give you these scriptures. I want you to write them down. It's there, teaching us just like it teaches. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, become a Christian. Just as plain. Concerning what motivates us, the proper motivation for action, Matthew 9, 36 through 38. Matthew 9, 36 through 38, and chapter 10, verse 1. Compassion is needed to properly handle those in danger. Galatians 6, verse 1. And 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 through 25. But he talks about the need for fear. I've seen some people, they don't seem to fear anybody or anything. But we need to fear, and here's why. Galatians 6, 1. Lest we be caught up in the same error or some other error that the wicked people practice regularly and give no thought about being wrong. If somebody else is caught up in a trespass so that they're separated from God, I must deal with them seeking to bring them back Considering myself, lest I also be tempted to sin, is what it means. That we might be motivated to persuade those in danger of being lost. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11. Just read how Paul did it, dealing with some brethren who were certainly guilty of some terrible things. Conclusion? Well, consider the list in Jude's final exhortations to the beloved in this section. Remember the words spoken before. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look for the mercy of our Lord. Be compassionate with fear. These exhortations might easily be called how to keep from falling, meaning falling from faith, being lost, or a part of earnestly contending for the faith, the New Testament system, or any part of it. Well, that's what Jude's seeking to do, remember, in writing these words of exhortation. So do we not see the need for heeding these same exhortations ourselves? Do we not face the same danger today that they did? Do we not desire the same blessings promised to the original recipients of this letter? What I can say is, may these words of Jude to his beloved serve as a guide for us today. Imagine the blessedness of a congregation in which every member is heeding these exhortations. Imagine the blessedness of seeing every one of your brothers and sisters in Christ, well, in this congregation, receiving the mercy of our Lord on that day when each one of us must stand before Him to receive of the deeds done in the body. Beloved, the question I leave with you is, are you keeping yourselves in the love of God today in the only way that you can? Well, not keeping some of His commandments, but keeping all the commandments God's ordained for Christians to keep in order to be faithful, that we can receive that mercy of our Lord when on the day of judgment He declares to the faithful, to the merciful, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. If you're not a Christian, now's the time to become one. We've studied already what it takes to become a Christian. As a child of God, let me ask you as God searches your heart, are you faithful in all things? Well, if you're not, then what thing are you not faithful in? Or what things are you not faithful in? And if you can know what it takes to be faithful, you can know when you're not faithful. If you know when you're not faithful, you know what to repent of. Is there godly sorrow? Sorrow toward God for your sins against Him? that would move you to fully break down your old stubborn will, the seed of all sin, rebellion against God. Turn from the error of your way, or maybe it's more than one error. Come to God confessing those sins and praying for forgiveness. You know, God's outstretched hand of salvation is going to be withdrawn someday. It won't be outstretched again. If you're subject to the call of our blessed Lord, who loved you and gave himself for you, will you come to him while we stand and sing?